Welcome to Business Insight. I'm Peter Marks. My guest is Julie Levinson. She's a film professor from Babson College and author of the new book, The American Success Myth on Film. Julie, pleasure to have you with us. Happy to be here. How did you first get involved with film? I was an undergraduate theater arts major, and in those days, what little film they offered was in that department. I started taking courses, and I had what every sh student should have, that wonderful moment of, wow, who knew that this was out there and was so interesting? And from then on, I was hooked. Now, you're a professor at Babson, which um, is a graduate and undergraduate school of business. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I've heard of a lot of places that, you know, people study different industries. But this is the first time that, you know, I've heard of, you talk about the content. How does that fit in, the content of films? How does that fit in with the uh, business curriculum? Mm. Good question. Um, unbeknownst to most people, Babson undergraduates take approximately half their courses in liberal arts. Uh -huh. And those courses are not liberal arts courses for business students. They're the sort of liberal arts mm -hmm. courses you get at any good mm -hmm. undergraduate college. Mm -hmm. um, so they have an array of choices mine among them, and they take philosophy, literature, anthropology, history, etc. Um, I think Babson is very much committed to mm -hmm. educating students not just for success at their vocation, but to be thoughtful and thinking and um, well-schooled adults. So that's part of the philosophy of the institution. Okay. Well, in that case, your film, your book probably fits in better than a lot of general <laughs> liberal arts courses Could because be. it is about Could be. business issues. Um, uh, something that I'm not sure of. Film versus movies. Is there a difference? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> no. No okay. semantic difference. Okay. And what inspired you to write the book? Many years ago, I taught a course called The American Success Myth in Film. Um, and when I started looking around for texts to use for my students, I found fascinating readings in sociology, in literature, and nothing in film. And that surprised me because there are so many films that deal with rags to riches stories and questions about success. Um, so I decided to write that book. And what, what is a myth? I mean, we kind of all uh, have a vague notion, yes. but don't really know. What does it mean? Vague and sometimes misunderstood notion. <laughs> I think in common parlance, we use myth to say something that is an untruth. Mm. Um, but I take pains in the first chapter of the book to explain how I'm using myth, mm. which is how anthropologists and scholars of religion refer to myth. And that is, uh, first of all, it's narrative. It tells a story. Mm. It's a story that is um, repeated and passed down within a culture through various channels. And that story does two things. Mm. One, it holds sort of sacred truths for that culture. Um, the other thing it does is it binds the people together, so it, it, it kind of um, causes a, a sort of cultural cohesion. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true of ancient myth, and I think it's as true of contemporary myth, our cultural narratives that we tell through any number of mm -hmm. channels, foremost among the movies. And what are some other American myths? People um, the frontier be. myth is, is one that I think has um, figured very strongly mm -hmm. in the national imagination. And like all myths... What, what is that? What is the frontier myth? Oh, the frontier <laughs> myth, the, this sort of um, myth of rugged individualism, the cowboy that goes out and tames the wilderness and um, brings civilization to the, the sort of untrammeled America that is out there. Um, so I, I think westerns, in the case of movies, are probably the best example of that. But um, there's a, a scholar named Richard Slotkin who has um, made it his life's work in three very hefty tomes um, to write about the frontier myth and how deeply it's woven into the fabric of our self-image as Americans, um, how much it emerges in our public discourse, certainly in our political discourse, as we have our candidates, Ronald Reagan famously um, riding his horse with a 10-gallon hat and talking about mourning in America. So the... Um, avatar of that myth, the cowboy, and the ideas behind the frontier myth are very much part of our self-image, I think. And the American success myth, Yes. what is that? In its most basic form, it is um, the old rags to riches story, the, the story of an individual, usually a low-born young man, who pulls himself up by his bootstraps through a sheer act of will. He overcomes any sort of accidents of birth, uh, that he might have. He overcomes any sort of systemic mm -hmm. obstacles to make it to the top and to achieve his goals. And when did 
kind of this start first appearing in ah. film? Is it the beginning of film itself, or did it, is there some particular event in time or whatever that caused this to start appearing? Yeah. Um, let me tell you first that that's a myth that goes back really a couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. And I write about that in the book, that um, the, the sort of underlying ideas behind the myth go way back to colonial times. Mm -hmm. They get reified in the 19th century. Well, well, before you go on, tell me how did it come about in colonial times? What caused it? Kind of how did people think of it? How did it get communicated? Well, I think there are, are, are a couple different seeds of it. One is if, if you read Cotton Mather, um, the idea that you wanted to work hard and succeed in order to earn the grace of God. Mm -hmm. So initially there's this religious underpinning and it wasn't for one's own material gain, it was for communal well-being and any material gain was tangible proof of God's favor. Um, ben Franklin in some ways secularizes the myth with Poor Richard's Almanac and other writings, Early to Bed and Early to Rise and all of these kind of homilies that suggest it's um, within one's self-control and it's an act of discipline in a way in order to achieve what one wants. So when we get to the 19th century, the, those ideas start to be narrativized. Um, and probably the most famous person who converts them into narrative is Horatio Alger, who starts writing um, right after the Civil War and is a remarkably prolific until his death at the end of the 19th century. Um, and that's where the idea of rags to riches comes up. Although if you read Alger, it turns out that most of his success stories aren't about achieving riches. They're about achieving kind of middle class status and respectability. Mm -hmm. And the rich people in those stories are often um, not very positive characters. Sometimes they're downright evil. So at this point, and ever onwards, I would say, we begin to get this kind of doubleness in the myth, that on the one hand, here's what you want to do to strive for success. On the other hand, there are pitfalls. And if you strive too hard, if you get too far too fast, um, there are downfalls. So that appears in Alger and I think um, keeps going on through various iterations of the myth. The movies engage it um, fairly early on once they uh, become set as, as a kind of um, apparatus, both the business apparatus and, and also um, the sort of narratives that they make. The movies start to engage the myth and my book um, begins right at the tail end of the silent era in examining diachronically and across many decades, um, what happens to the myth and in what ways does it change and what ways does it remain constant? Okay. First, why don't we just, what is, is there a thesis to the book, would you say? <laughs> um, yes, there, there is certainly a thesis and there are many sub-theses. <laughs> um, but I think my thesis is that what we generally think of as consensus about what comprises success is in fact um, much more complex than that. And there's a great deal of cultural ambivalence mm -hmm. about what's necessary to achieve success, um, how it's defined, what one has to sacrifice in the pursuit of it. And I think if you examine our cultural narratives, mm -hmm. which I do through um, a little bit through what comes before movies, but primarily through our movies, um, I, I think you see that ambivalence working itself out. So I think of the movies as a kind of public space where we can have a conversation and conduct a civic discourse about um, what is success in America, to what extent does individual success get conflated with the very idea of America itself and American exceptionalism, um, a term that's being bandied about and debated quite a bit as we speak. So the silent era ends. Was it the end of the silent era that's caused kind of this American success myth to be reflected in film? Or was there something else going at that time? What, what were the kind of the years when the silent, silent film era ended? Um, sound comes to film in 1927, and I don't think specifically there's any great ratcheting of. I think it is there from the start. Um, but obviously, when we get to the Depression era, in particular, there's a lot of rumination um, in, in all sorts of cultural channels about uh, class, social class issues, obviously. Um, and what constitutes success. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a, I, I spend a lot of time in the book looking at depression era films of various stripes um, and talking about uh, how they depict success and, and mm -hmm. um, social ascension. What are some of the most important books you would, you would say, books, <laughs> films during the depression that kind of reflect some of these issues? Ah, uh, they range. I have a chapter in which I explore some comic films um, and I write about 
a film called You Can't Take It With You. I think the title in some ways says it right there. Um, it's a film about the joys of unemployment um, and the importance of play. Uh, and the people who are successful in that film are, uh, in a couple of cases, actually physically ill um, and, and um, beset by their drive for success. So it's a film that enters the conversation in suggesting that, well, we have to balance out that sort of American ambition um, with spiritual success and try to define that. So um, that, that would be one of them that I think is quite interesting. There is a film in the early 30s called Hallelujah, I'm a Bum. And its title actually has an exclamation point after it, just to make it a little more emphatic. It, it has stars, a great ring. I've never seen it, but I yes, you know, remember the title. The title, <laughs> and it became a, quite a well-known song for that matter as well. It stars Al Jolson, who was at the time a big star, although I have to say after this film, um, his fortunes plummeted a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's a very odd, fascinating film um, with, with an interesting pedigree. Rogers and Hart do the music. Uh, and it's a, a film, again, that I think has some pretty fascinating things to say about um, the price of success and, and how we might recalibrate um, the sort of easy notion of success as vocational attainment. So there's this very interesting conversation going on throughout the decades about the American version of success, which is primarily defined vocationally. What do you do professionally? and that indicates your level of success. Um, and there's this undercurrent and kind of counter conversation that suggests, well, no, there's more to success than simply vocational achievement. During the war, World War II, <coughs> not a lot of focus, you know, most people had professions in the Army related to it. Right. Was there anything going on in film that related to this? I mean, I think yeah. there are always things going on in film, but certainly I find much less in the early 40s. Mm. Um, one of the flagship films, however, comes shortly after the war, everybody's favorite Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life, mm. um, which I think often gets misread and dismissed as a sappy, sentimental endorsement of the little people. Um, that, you know, don't worry about that other stuff. As long as you have your friends in your community, you're fine. And of course, that is a lovely ending to that film, um, and, and it is indeed heartwarming, but I think what doesn't get recognized enough is it's a very sophisticated and really quite dark take mm -hmm. on the American success myth um, and on this idea that as long as you apply yourself hard enough, you can make it. We have a character who is remarkably able, mm -hmm. he's smarter than anybody else in town, he works hard, he's good-hearted, and he doesn't make it. So all those movies in which we have the dream defined as this striving for success and voila, we're at the top of the mountain. Um, here we have an instance of the dream deferred where our protagonist um, continually mm -hmm. defers that dream and actually gets punished for not having single-sided individualism. He mm -hmm. gets punished for his fealty to the community. Um, so that's one of the films that I think is really a linchpin in the discussion of American success mm -hmm. and is much more interesting and much more complex and ramified in a way than its popular image would suggest. How about late 40s and the 50s, kind of, one might say, glory years for this country? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 50s are fascinating, and I write a good deal about them in the book. Um, it is a time of affluence. It's a time when America takes center stage on the world stage. Um, and it's a time when this conversation about success is going on in the culture at large. So there are several books. Um, there's The Lonely Crowd by David Reisman. There is um, White Collar by C. Mills Wright. Um, there is The Organization Man by William White. These are, are three really important books that are widely read way outside of the academy, written by sociologists, um, talking about the era of corporate uh, consolidation in a way and the corporatization of the American workforce. And I think the movies enter that conversation as well and, and are really good companion pieces to those books and to the conversation that's going on in those boom years and those post-war years. Um, so we get a number of films at that point which are about corporate workplace movies. Uh, and, and there's um, Executive Suite, there's one called mm -hmm. Patterns, there is an MGM musical of all things called It's Always Fair Weather, there's The Apartment in the very early 60s, um, and all of these examine the corporate workplace. 
uh, and, and sort of the, the corporate MO, kind of um, the corporate design, and talk about what that does to individual yearnings um, and to the individual sense of himself. By and large, it's not a pretty picture. These mm -hmm. movies, um, like the books, like the sociological treatises, are quite critical of what's lost um, as we move into the era of the organization man. And what's lost is, is according to the movies, um, this kind of individualist, entrepreneurial spirit. Um, all of that gets tamped down by having to conform and having to mark in, march in lockstep to the requisites of the corporation. How about the last few years? Um, what, what do things look like? <laughs> what do things look like? Um, one of the theses that I uh, have in the book is that the more things change, the more they stay the same. That although one would think as social and economic circumstances are altered throughout the years, you get quite different sorts of stories. But in fact, I think one of the things that myth does is it flattens out history. So I was surprised when I did my research over the years at how much um, stability there is to the myth in some ways. And that is one of the definitions of myth, that it adapts to the times superficially. Um, and yet there's this kind of flatness to the sort of story that gets told and constancy. So we see a lot of the same subtext emerging in recent years. Um, I think we've got an, uh, had an, an, an many, many interesting movies in the last few years. If you want to talk about corporate workplace movies, you look at something like Boiler Room from a few years ago, um, the highly satirical office space. Um, and even something as, as recent as The Social Network, which is a film about entrepreneurship, one of these um, defining characteristics of the ideal American worker. Um, I think that too is a highly ambivalent film. So on the one hand, we have the Zuckerberg character who clearly is wildly successful. If you look at the last moments of that film, we have a character who once again, at the top of the heap professionally, personally, is lacking. Um, he is, well, the, the old cliche, it's lonely at the top. Um, so this is one of the many tensions that we get throughout these movies. And I think um, one of my claims in examining myth is going back to myth theorists, um, particularly someone like Claude Lévi-Strauss, uh, an anthropologist who examined myth across several books, and says what myth does is it helps us work through cultural contradictions. Those are th so this contradiction that you're nobody if you're at the bottom, however, it's lonely at the top. Um, how do we reconcile that? That's total tension between those two things that we're told repeatedly throughout our lives. So I think myths are a way of working through those contradictions, um, helping us bandy them about, and in a way um, play with them in this cultural space. How would you compare books and film in terms of as a medium for conveying myths? Um, oh, but that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, film has an immediacy um, it, it, you know, when, when we're watching movies, well, the, the scholars have done studies physiologically. We, our eyes are literally wide. We're wide-eyed. Um, you know, our, our eyes dilate. Our pulse beat quickens. We're sitting. Well, we used to sit in the dark with strangers. Now we're watching it on our little tiny iPhone or some such. But this idea of gathering in a public place to have this ritualized sort of experience goes way back to ancient myth as well. Um, and I think there is a, a certain way that films um, hit you in the gut and, and really are, are just such a strong medium affectively. Um, so I, I think in that way they're a shared cultural experience in a way that many, many books are too, um, but perhaps there's not that same immediacy in the experience of, of actually experiencing them and sitting down and enjoying it. It's a fascinating area. In order to learn more, people are going to have to read your book, The American Success Myth on Film by Julie Levinson, professor at Babson College. Julie, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. For me as well. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.